Unit, Chuck Davis, Chief Compliance Officer, and Andre Johnson Brown, Alicia Vassell, and Julius Caranda Investigators. Today, the Rules Committee will consider the nominations of Kenneth, Kenneth Knuckles for reappointment to the City Planning Commission, Thomas Nichols, and Francis Henn for appointment to the Tax Commission, and Christopher Bastardi and Melanie Crivellis, I hope I'm pronouncing your names okay, for appointment to the Youth Board. If the Council gives its advice and consent, Mr. Knuckles, a Bronx resident, will be reappointed to the City Planning Commission and will serve the remainder of a five-year term that expires on June 30th, 2020. The Chair receives an annual salary of 214000 $413. The member who is designated as vice chair receives an annual salary of $65,271. The other members receive an annual salary of $54,150. <coughs> Pursuant to the New York City Charter, the City Planning Commission must consist of 13 members with seven appointments, which includes the appointment of the chair made by the mayor one appointment each made by the public advocate and each borough president. All members except the chair are subject to the advice and consent of the council. According to the charter, the members should be chosen for their independence, integrity, and civic commitment. CPC members serve for staggered five-year terms except for the chair who, as director of the Department of City Planning, serves at the pleasure of the mayor. These CPC members, other than the chair, are not considered regular city employees, and there is no limitation on the number of terms a CPC member may serve. However, CPC members are prohibited from holding any other city office while serving on the C CPC. Responsibilities of the CPC has several responsibilities. Some of their duties include engaging in planning, focused on the city's orderly growth, improvement, and future development, which should involve considerations concerning appropriate resources for housing, business, industry, recreation, and culture. <clears throat> Assisting the mayor and other officials in developing the 10-year capital strategy, the four-year capital program, as well as the annual statement of needs. Overseeing and coordinating environmental reviews under the City Environmental Quality Review, CEQR, mandated by the state's environmental conservation law. Every four years, the CPC must also prepare and file a zoning and planning report with with the mayor, the council, the public advocate, the borough presidents, and the community boards. The report should contain their planning policy along with a proposal for implementing that policy, including any associated recommended amendments, if any, to the zoning resolution. <clears throat> the report must also include the plans and studies CPC undertook or completed in the previous four years. CPC must review and either approve or deny any city proposal involving the city's request to make acquisitions for office space and requests for existing buildings for office use. Rules and standards established by the CPC. 
The CPC also establishes various rules. Some of these rules consist of establishing minimum standards for certifying the Uniform Land Use and Review Procedure, also known as ULAP, applications, which includes the, the creation of a specific time period for pre-certification reviews, establishing, establishing criteria associated with the selection of sites for capital projects, establishing minimum standards for the form and content of plans for the development of the city and boroughs and adopting rules that either list major concessions or establishes a procedure for determining whether a concession is defined as a major concession as it relates to the act of city agencies granting concessions. I want to welcome the candidates and welcome Mr. Knuckles. It's very nice to see you again. Mr. Knuckles was in charge of DCAS in the 90s for a very long time and did a very great job doing that. And um, would you like to raise your right hand, please? Should I stand? I'm Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Do you mish, wish to make an opening statement? Yes. Uh, thank you very much, and good morning, Chair Koslowitz and honorable members of the Committee on Rules, Privileges, and Elections. Uh, my name is Kenneth Julius Knuckles, and I would like to thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to speak about my nomination to serve on the City Planning Commission. Since my graduation from law school in 1977, public service has been a focal point of my professional career, specifically in the areas of land use and community development. In 1985, after several years as a city government attorney, I was appointed an assistant commissioner at HPD during the Koch administration. During this period, the city was grappling with the issue of more than 60,000 units of abandoned in-rem housing, 40% of which were located in the Bronx. In 1987, I was appointed Deputy Bronx Borough President by then Borough President Fernando Ferrer. And under his leadership, I worked closely with the Koch administration to steer a significant portion of $5 billion that the city had allocated to the most critical areas of the Bronx in order to halt the decline and begin the renewal of my beloved borough. As the chair kindly uh, indicated, in 1990, I joined the Dinkins administration as commissioner of the Department of General Services, now known as DCAS, where a major portion of my responsibility was management of the city's real estate portfolio. Accordingly, in September 2000, when nominated by Borough President Ferrer to serve on the City Planning Commission, I relished the opportunity to bring to bear the experience and perspective I had garnered during my varied roles in city government. I was appointed Vice Chair of the Planning Commission in March of 2002 by Mayor Bloomberg, and with the exception of a four-month hiatus in 2011, continued in that position until December 6, 2019. I cite this chronology not so much to make the obvious point, and that is I've seen and done a lot during my time in and around city government, but to hopefully underscore my commitment and devotion to the city of New York. I have served on the City Planning Commission under the present and previous mayors, always as an independent voice, drawing on decades of experience in economic and community development. I believe that public service, when done honestly and done well, is the highest of endeavors. That is the standard I have always maintained and will continue to seek if I should be so privileged as to be reappointed. Thank you for your time and consideration this morning, and I welcome any questions you may have. Um, can you please describe how, as a member of the City Planning Commission, you balance the city's needs for more affordable housing with concerns in certain neighborhoods that increased development could lead to gentr gentrification? 
that is obviously the, the most pressing issue, I think, uh, that uh, the City Planning Commission has at the moment. Um, I balance it, Chair, uh, based on uh, the knowledge that I have that the demand for affordable housing, uh, for the most part, is coming out of neighborhoods, uh, many of which that have not undergone uh, a major rezoning since 1961. Uh, so when we look at rezoning, uh, we look at a number of criteria. Uh, you want to look at proximity to mass transportation. You want to look at uh, the density levels in those neighborhoods, and particularly those neighborhoods that have not undergone rezoning since 1961. There is generally a capacity for more density. Uh, you want to look at um, the opportunity uh, for uh, affordability, and now under the mandatory inclusionary housing requirement, anytime there is an enhancement in terms of, uh, of uh, FAR or the amount of units that you can build, uh, mandatory inclusionary housing is required. So um, my formulation is to uh, look at uh, the particular parcel in question and to uh, evaluate whether or not uh, it is a, a parcel or a set of parcels that are appropriate for, for more density, and uh, whether or not that parcel or those parcels are um, near public transportation where uh, citizens, particularly citizens of, of moderate income, uh, can travel. And uh, I balance those equities and uh, if I think that it's appropriate for a, a rezoning, I vote accordingly. Okay. I things, but at the same time, I'm very concerned about, you know, what is going on. I mean, they're taking away businesses and building buildings, and it's very concerning to me. Well, I know that the department is currently reevaluating uh, uh, the CICRA uh, document at the moment, and particularly looking at impacts uh, around demographics and infrastructure, and I think it appropriate. Uh, obviously, where you're going to add uh, large numbers of new residents, uh, there's going to be a perceived impact on schools, as well as transportation, as well as businesses. Um, I believe that most of the development that, that's happening now is mixed use in that there is ground floor retail, uh, as well as residential above. So uh, there also has to be a concern about the ability for local businesses to uh, uh, in many cases, relocate uh, where they might have been displaced into these new properties. So it's an ongoing uh, uh, balancing test. But um, I think um, in order to address what we all know is, is, is a pressing issue of affordability, uh, we have to look at opportunities where there is a, a, uh, an option to build, but build appropriately and not out of scale. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, and I look forward to working with you. Thank you. Any questions? Council Member Rose. Good morning. Good morning, Councilwoman. Um, and uh, I'm impressed with your, your very um, extensive service to New York City uh, and, um, and the fact that you're not a novice uh, at city planning. Um, having gone through several major ULERPs, uh, ULERP, um, I find that the process is quite convoluted. It takes an awful long time. Uh, the council member winds up engaged in sort of a song and dance with the administration. And um, the CICRA, uh, 
addresses like the minimal level, the, the lower level, the lowest level at which um, a, a standard is accepted. I, and I'm not, I know I'm not saying this very articulately, um, but um, in, my, in my rezoning, uh, it was found that, uh, that the negative impact on traffic, say, um, was found at the lower level instead of the realistic level, which was highly, you know, um, impactful of the, the community that was going to receive this um, new housing. Mm -hmm. um, is there some conversations around um, that process, SICRA, and looking at numbers um, more realistically in terms of the impact that it's going to have on, com on communities? Um, is there any conversation about um, the process in which a council member has to um, actually fight with the administration to put the infrastructure in place that should truly be in place and not minimized? Um, I hope I'm making sense to no, you. No, I, I, I think uh, the issues that you are raising underscore the need for a reevaluation re of, of, of CICRA and, and, and a possible an updating of it. Um, I can't go into great detail because the department is actually uh, doing the, uh, the analysis, but I would assume that a part of that is certainly outreach to the land use unit of, of the city council. Mm -hmm. And ultimately there should be an opportunity for, for council members uh, and, and, and the city council to have its input into the formulation of, of, of criteria and the, uh, the uh, data sets around it. So. Um, I think um, there's a recognition that it's, it's time to, to uh, revisit the, um, the metrics that are currently in CICRA. I would appreciate that. Um, not that I'm looking to go through another ULERP uh, <laughs> before I leave, but um, I would appreciate that. And um, is there any um, plans to revisit um, um, the affordable housing formula. Is there any plans to visit, revisit the? Um, you mean around? What is it called? M MIH. 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 Yeah. Well, that that is uh, legislation, which means you know it, it, it emanates from the city council. So uh, you right. will probably know before I do. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I would just want, before I call on uh, Margaret Jen, I would like to recognize uh, Council Member Espinal and Council Member Gibson. Council Member Chin. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, Mr. Good morning. <laughs> and um, thank you, you know, for your public service. And you know, in my district, we, we go before city council, I mean, city planning quite a bit. Um, so I wanted to ask you a question about um, the, the two bridges area. Um, I know that the, uh, the city planning, you know, um, told us that it was um, minor modification, uh, that uh, the project, the three humongous uh, project that was gonna come into that area did not have to go through ULERP, and then we ended up filing a lawsuit against the city yes. uh, and city planning. And so far we have kind of halted the project. Um, but I, I guess my question to you in, in that scenario where a site, you know, was an urban renewal site. And when you look at that number of unit being inundated into an area that's already you know, oversaturated and don't have all these essential services like public transportation, you know, one subway and, you know, subway um, station, 
and with limited entrance and no accessibility. Uh, but then, like, all of a sudden, you're talking about three huge projects, I mean, projects that's going to ask, you know, a humongous number of units. And what they're offering in terms of affordable housing is voluntary, it wasn't even mandatory, and it's minimal. Um, so when city planning, when, when you look at a project like that, even though technically, I, I don't think the, that the staff and the commission say, oh, it's, it's technically is a minor modification, so we don't have to go through a full Euler. So how do you sort of rectify that, looking at you know, the impact, the negative impact on the community? Uh that was a tough, tough case. And uh, we know it's currently in litigation and obviously the commission will be bound by the findings of, of uh, the findings of, of, of the, uh, the court. Um, I think uh, that underscores, as I, as, I, as I said to council member Rose, uh, um, a revisiting of SECRA and um, you know, as the commission was 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 bound uh, by uh, the precedent that this was not a rezoning. Uh, the 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 bulk, which we understood, was a lot more than than what was existing uh, in that neighborhood, uh, was permissible under under the zoning. But I understand from your vantage point and, and the vantage point of, member, uh, of many of the uh, community, much of the community, that it was nonetheless uh, the introduction of a lot more density than uh, was there. Um, so I, I, I think in hindsight, you know, we'll, we'll have to uh, uh, look at uh, CICRA, uh and we'll have to look at situations, uh, hopefully there won't be many, but um, situations in which, you know, uh, dramatic density is introduced into a community, and um, if a rezoning is appropriate, um, then, um, or a ULERP is appropriate, then uh, it perhaps should be required. Because relating to that is that, I guess, I mean, Department of City Planning. So my, my question is around the, the planning part. Right. Because this area was originally an urban renewal site. Right. Right, and the renewal expired, and the community weren't aware that it was, you know, expired. Um, so we had to, the city council, we had to pass legislation now, you know, that when a urban renewal site is about to expire, they have to inform community board council. So at least the community can prepare to see whether, how we can still, you know, protect the area, rezoning or whatever. But in that, in that case, we were not prepared. Uh, but with the city planning, I guess my question is that looking ahead, is that one of city planning's responsibilities should be really looking at some of the area where originally was urban renewal site or some area that the zoning uh, should be changed. Uh, so more of that planning perspective to see how we can meet the need you know, for affordable housing. Maybe some area could rezone to allow more density uh, so a, a more broader picture uh, of the whole city. Because the other concern I have is all these as of right development. Uh, because in that area, at the Two Bridges area, we have this humongous 80-story Extel building, and it was built on the former Pathmark site because the urban renewal expired, and they were able to do something as of right, and then they got you know, tax abatement to build a poor building next door, and they have this humongous tower, and they took away in an affordable supermarket in the area. And there was nothing we can do, because they could do it as a right. Right, right. I understand your concern. Uh, I think 
the department will, and I'm not speaking for the department, but personally, uh, I will be looking to the ultimate outcome of the litigation to see what lessons can be derived from the decision. I'm sure there'll be many, but moreover, I think the department will obviously be looking at uh, the experience around uh, uh, the Two Bridges uh, site and uh, look to ameliorate, if you will, uh, uh, the concerns that, that I think justifiably and appropriately were expressed by the community. Thank you. I mean, I look forward to working with you um, continuously. And I think we really, the city plan should really, really look at comprehensively because we desperately need affordable housing. So like, we you know, expect the, the department to really help us in that effort. I, I believe the department is, 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 ready, is uh, willing, ready, and able to do that. Great, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Knuckles. We're not voting today, we'll be voting on December 19th, this coming Thursday. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions? All right, the second topic. If the council gives its advice and consent, Ms. Hen, a Queens resident, will be appointed as the president of the New York City Tax Commission for a six-year term that begins on January 7, 2020 and expires on January 6, 2026. <coughs> and Mr. Nichols, a Staten Island resident, will be appointed to the Tax Commission and will serve a six-year term that begins on January 7, 2020 and expires on January 6, 2026. The Tax Commission is charged with the duty of reviewing and correcting all assessments of real property within the City of New York that are set by the New York City Department of Finance. Any commissioner shall exercise such other powers and duties as the President of the Commission may, from time to time, assign. The Commission has a President and six Council Commissioners all of whom have at least three years of experience in the field of real estate or real estate law. The president receives an annual salary of $221,151. Com commissioners receive an annual salary of $25,677. I want to welcome to the candidates, and if you can please raise your right hand to be sworn in. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Ms. Hen, would you like to make an opening statement? Thank you. Good morning, Chair Koslowitz and members of the New York City Council Rules Committee. Thank you for considering me for an appointment as president of the New York City Tax Commission. It's a privilege and an honor to be considered. I've been a New York City resident my entire life and was born and raised in Queens. I'm a homeowner and my family has lived in our home in Queens for the past 24 years. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> my two children are proud graduates of the New York City public school system. I've had the pleasure of working in city government and serving the people of the city for over 37 years as a tax attorney. During that time, I was recognized by the New York City Law Department and the New York City County Lawyers Association for my public service. I hope to continue that service as president of the Tax Commission, and I believe my experience qualifies me to do so. As the Council is fully aware, annual property tax assessments are the basis for the real property tax levy, the city's largest single source of revenue. There are over one million parcels of real property in the city, and under New York State and city law, each property owner has the right to an independent administrative review of the assessed value of its property before the Tax Commission. The Tax Commission's mission, and my mission if appointed as president, is to ensure that determinations of real property assessment appeals are made fairly, efficiently, and in a transparent manner. 
I know how daunting the tax assessment challenge can be, particularly for unrepresented taxpayers. I have attended many outreach sessions as a representative of the Tax Commission, where I explained how the assessment and tax were calculated, walked taxpayers step by step through the calculation, and further explained what needs to be established in order to challenge that assessment. I found that experience extremely gratifying. In addition to outreach sessions, as President of the Tax Commission, I hope to continue the considerable efforts expended by the current President, Ellen Hoffman, toward annually reviewing the Tax Commission's forms, instructions, and procedures, as well as information provided on the Tax Commission's website, with a view towards providing either even greater clarity and transparency. In addition to helping property owners better understand their assessment, when a property owner challenges their assessment, I hope to make their experience at the Tax Commission as satisfying as possible. By that I mean, while they might not in all cases get the reduction they want, they will be informed as to how best to present their position and will have an opportunity to be heard before an impartial and respectful forum. Since 2016, I've been a commissioner of the New York City Tax Appeals Tribunal, which he hears appeals involving city-administered taxes other than the property tax. During that same time, under a delegation from President Hoffman, I have conducted thousands of tax commission hearings on applications for review involving valuation, classification, and exemptions. As you know, the Tax Commission and Tax Appeals Tribunal are combined under the umbrella of the Office of Administrative Tax Appeals, which jointly administers the two agencies. Together, the Tax Commission and the Tribunal provide independent administrative review of all city tax assessments. Prior to joining the Tribunal, I worked at the New York City Law Department, Office of the Corporation Council. Tax and Bankruptcy Division for over 34 years, serving initially as a staff attorney and later supervising staff attorneys and support staff, as well as handling significant tax litigation. I also helped develop tax policy, reviewed proposed tax legislation, and advised various city agencies regarding their tax issues. In addition, I worked closely with the division's chief on issues connected with our division's administration, including budget and personnel. The real property tax litigation I supervised at the Law Department necessarily involved an in-depth analysis of complex real estate appraisals, as well as an examination of how real property is held and used. I'm a voracious reader of anything related to real property trends and issues. The tax issues I addressed while at the Law Department also included those arising in cases involving other city taxes that require a comprehensive understanding of real estate ownership and related transactions, including leasing, transfer, and financing. In conclusion, I believe my experience well qualifies me to administer the tax appeals process in a way that is as fair, transparent, and efficient as possible. I again thank you for your attention this morning, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Before we continue, I want to recognize Council Member Richie Torres has joined us. Uh, Mr. Um, Nichols, opening statement, please. Yes, thank you. Good morning, Chair Kozlowitz and members of the New York City Rules Committee. My name is Thomas Nichols and I am pleased to be here today and have the opportunity to discuss with you the position of Staten Island part-time commissioner for the New York City Tax Commission. I started my career in civil service with the New York City Department of Finance in 1987, where I worked for almost three years as an assistant city assessor assigned to various districts in the borough of Queens. Queens. <laughs> Just, I, I, I'm sorry, I had to do that. <laughs> I'm getting to you. I'll get to you in a minute. 
This entry-level position allowed me to acquire the fundamentals in valuing real estate for tax purposes in the city of New York. It also allowed me to interact with the taxpaying public, clarify for them the complex property tax system, and assist them in obtaining senior citizen and veterans exemptions. I joined the New York City Tax Commission in 1989 as a level one city assessor and have been fortunate enough to have a successful 28 and a half year tenure with the commission. During my career with the Tax Commission, I was promoted to a level two and later a level three city assessor before, before retiring in 2018 as the deputy director of the appraisal and hearings group, level four assessor, and with the designation of certified city assessor. Coincidentally, part of my duties as deputy director was to train newly hired part-time commissioners, administrative law judges, and assessors regarding policy, procedures, and valuation methodology for the New York City Tax Commission. I've also worked with other city agencies during my time at the Tax Commission, most frequently with the Department of Finance and the New York City Law Department's certiorari and condemnation division on specific issues or cases. I have also been a part of the Tax Commission's efforts over the years to reach out to the property owners through individual borough briefings to better help them understand the assessment and appeal process. During my years of service, I have personally conducted, decided, and reviewed between 75,000 and 100,000 property tax cases. As deputy director, I was one of only four people entrusted with conducting hearings on the highest valued parcels in New York City. I believe my experience and my continued desire to help property owners better understand, understand the city's assessment and review process qualifies me for the responsibilities of part-time commissioner for Staten Island. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, being a lifelong New Yorker, born in Brooklyn, and currently a homeowner in Staten Island, <laughs> I feel that I have a better understanding of the challenges that Islanders face, such as the longer commute into Manhattan with no direct train service, infrastructure, pro infrastructure problems, storm sewers for drainage in Staten Island Expressway, and the newer housing stock resulting in a lower benefit from assessment caps compared to the class one properties in the outer boroughs. I look forward to using my 30 plus years of experience and my understanding of the property tax system to continue serving my fellow New Yorkers. Thank you again for considering me for this position. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Ms. Hen, based on your experience with the Tax Commission, what changes would you make if you were confirmed as president of the Tax Commission? Um, I would uh, look towards migrating away from paper to uh, greater use of technology. Right, right now, this current year, we had 57,000 applications. That's all on paper. All of our files are on paper. And um, I believe that uh, migrating to uh, greater use of technology would um, certainly make the uh, process at the Tax Commission of managing those files and reviewing those files uh, more efficient, but uh, could also translate to um, a, a more uh, efficient and user-friendly mechanism for taxpayers to challenge their uh, tax assessments. So you're for digitizing? Uh, that's correct. Okay. Um, Mr. Nichols. Many property owners file a tax appeal as a matter of course every year, seemingly without regard for whether they have good cause, hoping they will receive some relief. What do they think about the pra what do you think about the practice and any potential overburdening it does to the commission? Do you think steps should be taken to discourage the practice? And if so, what would you do to address this issue? That's a very good question. Uh, there are, I, I know there are firms that do handle uh, rather large real estate clientele, and they actually they protest on their entire portfolio, whether they're overassessed or not. And with the, with the intention being, I can always file a writ against the city and 
maybe it's more of a protective writ where in case the assessment ratio drops, they have a, a, an, an argument in court. But um, we do give the representatives an opportunity to not ask for a personal hearing for those cases. And hopefully we can persuade them to do that. As uh, Ms. Hen said, the, we get 57,000 protests a year. We don't actually have a personal hearing on every one of those cases. We allow the representatives to pass on certain cases that they don't feel that there is, uh, they can reach the burden of proof. So if we can encourage them to do that more and, and pass on cases that really, according to valuation methodology, there's really nothing there in the case, I think we can streamline it a little bit better and, and hopefully not have as many hearings each year. Thank you, <clears throat> and thank you very much. And like I said, we'll uh, have a hearing on December 19th for the vote. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Thank you. I had a feeling. I just have to <laughs> I gave you a hard time. Okay. I, <laughs> you're excused, uh, and now we're going to call on Oh, oh, Mr. Bas oh, what? Uh, you have a question? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Or or a comment? Okay. Or I I want to um I want to say I'm really glad to see you here. Thank you. Um, Pleasure to be here. And uh, you know, this tax issue is a huge issue for Staten Islanders, and um, we're very concerned about the disparities. Um, and I see where you have. Uh, actually conducted borough briefings. Yes. I, I want to first applaud you for doing that. I, I think that much more is necessary because the the structure is is pretty um, convoluted and it's it's very difficult for for folks to understand. Even with a briefing, it's, it's difficult to understand and. Um, and on Staten Island especially, with the disparities, um, are you, would you, are you planning to do more outreach to, to um, homeowners, not just in Staten Island, but um, do you see um, any value in reaching out to homeowners to explain um, the process and, um, Yes, well, each year the, uh, when in, in January when property owners receive their uh, notice of value, that's usually probably when your phone starts ringing off the hook or all of, all of your phones start ringing off the hook. And, um, and the Department of Finance sets up these briefings and we go along with them uh, to each borough. And I think I actually I was at one uh, at the business center in Staten Island at, at St. Mark's Place with, with you. And we usually have them uh, upstairs on the fourth floor in that building. But uh, we have a, mo uh, a morning session and a night session. So anyway, that's working can, can come to the night session. We can actually help them uh, personally. And, and I think that that's the key because um, I've helped hundreds, maybe thousands of people explaining that, especially one, two, and three family homeowners, the assessment process, what they have to do, what forms they have to file where to get the evidence and the information to prove their case, and the actual number that they have to disprove. Because I know there's a little, there's always some, you know, the Department of Finance gives a market value, an effective market value, and an assessment. Right. And we have to explain what each number means and what they, what they need to do to reduce their taxes. Uh, as far as briefings go, you know, giving that direct customer service to people, I mean, sometimes you actually, it's like you see a light switch go on where they finally get it. And, and they're only gonna get that with somebody taking the time and explaining things to them. You know, we, we can put things online and we can put it in our instructions, but I think it helps when we're actually making that, that contact with the public. And I, I actually enjoy doing it. So that. you wouldn't be adverse to more outreach and- um, Not at all, with not at all. I think it would help uh, tremendously. Yeah, I do too. Um, and there, uh, we did appoint a commission, right? Okay. And they did a study, uh, and we haven't heard from them yet. Yeah. 
And so I don't know who should be pushing whom, but um, it would be interesting. I would like to see uh, the tax commission uh, sort of encourage the commission that was set up to study the, the property tax issue. Um, if we could kind of make that happen so we can see some movement on, um, on the, the tax structure. Mm -hmm. I'm actually, I'm, I'm uh, anxious to see what they come up with also. As well? Okay. Yes. And you're willing to work with them? Yeah. Oh, you yes, definitely. Okay. Certainly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now our third topic. If the council gives its advice and consent, Mr. Pistardi, a Manhattan resident, yay for Manhattan, <laughs> and Ms. Crivellis, a Brooklyn resident, will be appointed to the youth board and will serve an undefined term and the position does not include any compensation. This is wrong. Where, where am I? You went backwards. Okay. There you go. Right at the top. The Youth Board serves as an advisory body to the Commissioner of the Department of Youth and Community Development with respect to the development of programs and policies relating to youth in the city. The board consists of 28 members appointed by the mayor, 14 whom are appointed upon recommendation of the council. The board must be representative of the community and include persons representing the areas of social services, healthcare, education, business, industry, and labor. The board meets quarterly and members serve without compensation. Welcome Mr. Pisati and Ms. Crivellis. Would you both raise your right hand to be sworn in? Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Bastardi, do you wish to have an opening statement? Yes. Members of the committee, I would like to thank you for taking the time today to consider my nomination to, to the Youth Board. As someone who has been active in New York Public Affairs matters for their entire career, I look forward with your approval to serving on the Youth Board and bringing my perspective, ideas, and passion forward to work to make New York City a better place for our young people. Society has too often, even with the best of intentions, neglected our youth. The Department of Youth and C C Community Development has been working tirelessly to help some of the most vo vulnerable members of New York's population. I, I hope that my past experience will be of value as, as we work together to do even more. I've worked with LGBTQ youth, and the conversations I had with teenagers at the Hedrick Martin Institute mattered so much more in shaping my perspective than the slew of studies I've come across about their well-being. According to the Center for American Progress, upwards of half of the youth homeless population identifies as, as LGBT. We know many come from emotionally and physically abusive homes and feel that they have nowhere to, to turn. We know that young immigrants, especially in the current political climate, feel so threatened that many are not accessing services in our city and state, despite not having to fear their data being used against them here. And our young people still are not making enough money to afford to live in our city, whether due to lack of opportunity, crippling student, student debt post-graduation, uh, post or because they don't have the foundational support at home. I hope that my years of activism in New York public affairs, of understanding how government works, believing we can work with the private sector to make necessary improvements when the government cannot handle the burden, and of truly believing that young people know when they are being listened to and when they are not, and that we must listen, make me a worthy candidate for your consideration. I do not think that I have all of the answers, but do think I can use my seat on the board to make this city a little bit better for New York young people. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Cravellis. Great. Am thank I pronouncing you. your names right? You did, yeah. So thank you for that. Um, and good morning. Uh, my name is Melanie Cruvellis, and I'm Senior Manager of Policy and Advocacy at Young Invincibles. 
I would like to thank the members of the New York City Council present today, as well uh, as the members and staff of the Committee on Rules, Privileges, and Elections for allowing me to speak before you today. Um, it is a great privilege and an honor to sit uh, in consideration of membership to the New York City Youth Board and for the opportunity to join the conversation on how New York can affirm its commitment to our city's younger generations. To give you a little background on the work that I do here in New York City, um, I work again with Young Invincibles. We are a policy and advocacy organization that's dedicated to elevating young adults in the political process. As a part of my work with Young Invincibles, as well as my uh, history working in local government, both here and in Washington, D.C., uh, I've spoken with young adults uh, across the city of New York, uh, so in all five boroughs, including Staten Island. Um, no, we've been talking about that a little bit today. Um, and I, I work with young folks on an issue, uh, a variety of issue areas, including uh, their access to higher education, so uh, considering how uh, things like access to housing, um, and counseling and the conditions of our uh, college climate encourage folks to persist in college. Uh, we also focus on thinking about how young adults are able to access health care, um, as well as workforce development and uh, the nature of work and civic engagement. So I've held focus groups uh, across the city of New York focusing on the intersection of homelessness and higher education. I've worked in collaborations with young people across CUNY, the student governments, uh, out of school and out of work homeless youth, um, and really a large cross-section of young people across the city here. Uh, and from these conversations, and as well as the research that I do, I can tell you with certainty that young people like myself face a world of instability and uncertainty um, in both the long term, so thinking about the catastrophic reality of climate change, to the more immediate, so having a safe, safe and stable place to stay at night. The Department of Youth and Community Development, along with its nonprofit and cross-agency partners, as well as the folks here in the City Council, play a pivotal role in connecting the next generations with the programs that both research and young people will tell you work. If selected to join the New York City Youth Board, I will bring my experience collaborating with young people across the five boroughs to reimagine the programs and supports that serve them. I will bring insights collected from our partners, our research, and our network of young people to shape these programs and make sure they're reaching folks appropriately. And I will bring a commitment to equity and an eye towards the redistribution of resources and power for those who have long been shot, uh, shut out of policy making, including New Yorkers who are black and brown, LGBTQI, young folks, immigrants, and or those young folks who are housing insecure. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak before you today, and I look forward to answering your questions. Council Member Adrian Adams. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you both uh, for being here this morning. Uh, this is a very, very uh, critical um, part of um, part of the work that we do surrounding youth. So I just have a general question for the both of you, and, and you can answer. Um, can you give us the top two in your estimation? The top two critical issues facing youth today and how you would tackle those top two issues. All right, I'll go first. Um, so thinking about the top two issues that uh, are facing young people in the city today, um, my headspace is thinking about um, affordable housing and more specifically thinking about how young folks are able to ensure that they have stable housing. So again, as part of my work with Young Invincibles, I spent the last year holding focus groups with more than 70 young people who've had some experience of housing insecurity or homelessness over the last year. Um, and as part of those focus groups really highlighted for me, um, you know, as I was sitting here and thinking about other folks who were, you know, uh, testifying for some of the other boards, including some that will more directly focus on issues of affordable housing, um, I believe my experience also shows the way that, you know, even though we tend to think about, you know, stable housing as purely an issue for folks looking at housing, um, my work really highlights, and what I heard from young people also highlights the way that housing sets folks up for future success. Um, and so for as Again, part of my work, I talked with folks about the intersection of uh, housing insecurity and how that impacts college access. And to me, that intersection is really critical in thinking about the future stability of young folks, particularly when we know that for young people um, who uh, are you know, working to increase their educational attainment, not having a high school uh, 
GED or um, you know, the task here in New York, uh, that makes you four and a half times more likely to experience homelessness. So as part of my work, I wanna make sure that you know, while there's a lot of important work happening with housing, housing is also a tool, or education is also a tool to stopping the cycle of homelessness in New York City. And I think some of the conversations I had with young folks really highlight that issue as well. Um, in terms of other um, major issues that are focused or that are impacting young people, um, I'm struggling to think of an exact category for this, but I'm thinking about some of the substantial structural issues that I know many young folks are are really grappling with, right? And how to access, um, you know, institutions such as the one that we're in today, and make sure that their voices are heard. And so navigating complex systems and and knowing that. You know, we have young folks today who take time to go out of school to make sure their voices are heard on issues of climate change, and I think that's been incredibly moving and powerful to hear. Um, but I know that from my work, uh, again, across the five boroughs here, that knowing how to access these spaces and how to make a change is really intimidating, especially when you consider the history of young people really being um, shut out of decision-making power, and again, particularly uh, different groups of young people. So. Um, in my work, I think, you know, I can think of particular issue areas that, of course, you know, have a lot of um, impact for young people, but also thinking about how they're able to access and, and influence, um, you know, some of these decisions that are truly impacting not just their day-to-day, -day, but their long-term. And so, again, if I were nominated for this board, I would take my experience in elevating those voices and teaching folks how, um, and really teaching together. There's so much that we learn when we talk with one another. So I think if I were nominated to this board, I would enjoy the opportunity to take some of that insight and make sure that folks are more connected with the decisions that are impacting their lives. Um, homelessness, I think, is number one. Um, and I don't think it's just about getting people in, in, in shelter. Obviously, that is the number one issue, is to make sure that somebody is safe and not on the streets and get them out of a dangerous um, uh, circumstance. But you know, beyond that, we have to take homeless youth and better set them up for success in life. Because if we don't, you're going to have a homeless young person that turns into a homeless person in their 20s and 30s. And that's only going to perpetuate a long-term cycle of, um, of you know, bad you know, decisions, um, some, some, some that they're you know, forced into. Um, so I think that we need to set young people up from a structural um, educational standpoint and then access to actually good paying jobs. It's not enough as a city that we just give people shelter. Um, we have to make sure that we are giving them education and access to college so that when they leave shelter they can get their own apartment and that they can get a job that you know they could pay for. Um, for the first time in American history we're seeing a decline in people going to college because it's so expensive, because people are making a decision of I am not going to take on this massive debt because our jobs aren't, aren't paying enough. And that brings me to you know point two, um, which we need to um, address um, and put pressure on, on, on you know, companies to pay young people more. Um, we cannot expect young people to graduate college with debt anywhere from $80,000 to $300,000 and pay them $35,000. It's just not fair. And we are going to lose people in, in, in you know, this city. We have the best companies and, and you know, best talents, and we're going to lose them elsewhere. So I think those are, 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 are the two biggest uh, is, uh, issues for me. Thank you both, and I especially thank you both for connecting the dots. Uh, we know that the exponential number of uh, children who are homeless, who, who right now are sitting in elementary schools and high schools, is devastating for the city of New York. And c connecting the dots, homelessness, the path through education to creating those that are in home safely, um, and more importantly, profitably. Um, so thank you both for your testimony. Thank you very much. Thank you. Council Member Rose. Hi. How are you both? Um, I was impressed with both of your, your resumes. Um, and I think it's really important that the people we have on the advisory board are people who have actually had experience working with young people. Um, it's, it's interesting to know it in theory and, and from a distance. Um, so I, I was pleased to see that you're, you, you have actually worked with young people 
um, and give an ear to some of their issues. Um, my colleague Adrian um, Adams addressed, you know, uh, my my one of my questions, and and you said that homelessness was um, something that is really important, and you know that uh, DYCD has uh, youth runaway and homeless youth programs, and that I feel like we're not able to even meet the need that we have. How would you, what would your recommendation be to DYCD um, in regards to addressing the homeless issue, homeless youth issue? Um, I think an idea, um, so when I worked with the Hedrick Martin in, uh, in, um, Institute, um, what I was able to see firsthand were kids who were a lot who were previously homeless and were able to find people like them and were given support. Um, and um, I think that giving, um, it is a stigma to you know, be homeless, um, whether you're an LGBT kid or, an, or, an, or, an, or, or a straight kid. Um, no one wants to go to school and be, you know, the you know homeless kid. And we've all read the articles that there are so many kids that are leaving school and going to shelters. Um, and in the other hearing, I was listening to, you know, how we can't even rely on this on this hotel system anymore. That it's just this burden of, um, you know, you 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 leave school or work and you go into a hotel and you're in a hotel room with like four people and to live there for more than a year is just cramming and it's demoralizing. Um, I think that we. Um, and, and, I, and I alluded to some of this in you know, my you know, responses. Um, you know, we, offer, you know, we offer companies in this city a slew of incentives. Um, they, get, they get tax breaks for, for you know, various things. Um, they get incentives to create jobs here. There are big debates about whether or not that, that should be continued or not. Um, and I think it's time that you know, we turn to them and say, how are you going to put up and, and give support to you know, people, like give them internships that you know, lead to actual jobs um, um, and give them actual uh, support. Um, I think that's a way that the private sector can come to, 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 to the table in a very meaningful way and you know, mention them in, in you know, a press release, you know, that'll help their you know, CSR efforts and everything. Um, so that's one idea that you know, I would have is, is you know, go to them. Um, and I know that companies are looking for ways left and right to you know, get involved, and many don't don't know how to, and they have internal committees that come up with you know ideas. We 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 can go to them and say we have this problem. You know, what can you do? Do you have five you know internships? If we can get you know every every bank and every top company to offer five internships to you know a, a homeless kid in, in, in you know high school, that's an amazing thing for 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 their resume. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I'm glad that my colleague here pointed out those issues, and I feel like we should talk after this. I think we have a lot of crossover in our work as well, hopefully on the youth board as well. Um, so in addition to some of those um, job elements, which I think are so critical uh, for thinking about youth who are experiencing homelessness, I also, again, want to sort of double down on some of the ways that I believe the education system can play a, a pivotal role um, in supporting these youths and the way that DYCD can, can sort of bridge connections both between uh, DOE as well as CUNY. So, you know, I think a lot of us in this room are very deeply disturbed by the numbers of students in temporary housing that we see in DOE. We know the one in 10 number, and that is far too high and a much higher number than anyone in here would like to see. Um, but one thing that I think is also important to note that uh, as young people um, complete high school or age out of high school, we also still see that issue uh, in our college systems here as well. So um, in CUNY, it's about 14% of young people experience homelessness while enrolled in CUNY, so actually a higher statistic than we see in DOE. Um, and of course, uh, in college, that is actually when you are expected to pay for education and you're paying for your textbooks, you're paying for your housing, you're paying for all of these other pieces. We also know that CUNY students are experiencing uh, food insecurity at very high rates, um, well above 50%, um, according to studies that have come out in March 2019. 
So I think there's a lot that can be done here. Um, again, as part of my work, I went to seven different um, runaway and homeless youth uh, drop-in centers and temporary or, or TILs um, uh, with DYCD over the last year, and again, spoke with a lot of young people there. And these were really, really tough uh, conversations. There's, you know, as my colleague here mentioned, there's a lot of different issues that come up when you talk to folks about housing insecurity. It can um, be related to someone's financial situation. It can also be related to uh, a history of trauma and um, family instability. And um, I think there's a lot of ways in which our systems could be strengthened uh, to better address um, some of those issues that are coming up. So again, I keep thinking about that, that connection between education, knowing that role that education can play in terms of putting someone on a path towards economic stability and some of those uh, jobs that uh, my colleague here recommended. Um, and so in, in terms of thinking about the work that DYCD can do, I think there's a lot that can be done to strengthen the connection between um, some of the services that are provided to young folks through DYCD and then some of the great educational opportunities that are provided through uh, the city and through the college system that's known for you know, propelling more uh, students than any other university system to the middle class. Um, and so we heard from young folks that um, you know, when they're in some of these uh, shelters that, you know, they're getting message and support around finding housing and, and getting sort of the next step, but there's often not space to think about, okay, what, what beyond the next step? And I think that young folks who are experiencing homelessness are absolutely deserve the opportunity to think ahead and, and think about what their futures are. And so I think there are ways that um, our systems can work uh, align better with one another. We actually just released a report that's talking about the ways in which the DOE, DY, ICD, CUNY, DHS, and HRA could all sort of work together and align some of these efforts to make sure young folks have, have access to um, a higher education and a college pathway that uh, leads them to economic stability. But um, one thing that comes to mind for me is, is thinking about the flexibility um, that folks um, have or don't have in some of these programs. So, um, you know, one thing that comes to mind is, uh, you know, we spoke to a young person who, after six years, finally graduated from Hunter College this last year um, after, you know, experiencing homelessness for, again, over six years. And um, she was able to stay in uh, a dormitory with CUNY, which is not necessarily the norm for our system, which is a particular challenge when thinking about these issues. Um, but the day after she graduated, she was not able to really celebrate her degree because she was uh, out of the dorms and didn't have anywhere to stay. And that's, that's not acceptable, right? Like, that's not what our systems are here for. Um, and so I think, again, if there are ways to facilitate conversations to ensure that it's not just, you know, one particular system that's thinking about you in crisis mode, but systems that allow you to think about, you know, your, your pathway, your career, your, your dreams, um, I think that is really critical. And so I think there's some strong opportunities there to, to you know, whether it's making sure that in DYCD uh, shelters we're advertising CUNY ASAP and some of these great programs that that really do uh, help students succeed. Um, I think there are some great opportunities for linkages there that will, that will long serve these students. Thank you. Um, I've, I, I'm really kind of excited because uh, both of you have a grasp of, you know, some of the issues that our young people are, are facing. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear this because I feel like there will be real advocates um, on the commission. DYCD, however, is um, primarily a contracting agency. And so um, oftentimes, uh, they're not able to impact directly. Um, and so sometimes it sets up situations that are not the most advantageous. Every year during budget time, I find myself um, trying to encourage the DYCD to request adequate funding to meet the needs. And you've expounded on some of the needs, but there are others. You know, we, we talk about workforce. There are young people who are vulnerable, who are living in housing projects that just, there just aren't opportunities. And DYCD usually tries to provide a pipeline so that their opportunities are available. I 
can't quite seem to get them, however, to fight for the amount of money that they need to try to fill the needs that exist. So would you be willing to be a voice on the commission to actually try to um, pair up the monies that are requested to, um, with what the actual need is? So that every year, Council Member Chin and I aren't, you know, fighting with the commissioner to um, to increase the um, the amount of funds that are, are needed um, to meet this. You know, every year SYEP, you know, work, learn, grow, Sonic, Compass. You know, there's a whole plethora of programs that are working to fill the need, but um, we're not getting enough monies to, to the programs. I, I'm just asking you to be really vocal advocates, um, especially around budget and need. So thank you. Um, I, I'm excited that we'll be able to work with you, I hope. Thank you. And to answer your question, Yes, yeah. <laughs> happy to play that role. Okay, anybody else? Okay, thank you very, very much. Thank, thank you. you. And I don't believe we have any uh, uh, comments from the public. Correct me if I'm wrong. Doesn't look like we do. With that, I wanna thank everybody this hearing of the Committee on Rules, Privileges, and Elections now stands in recess to be continued on the morning of, the, of Thursday, December 19th, 2019. With that, this meeting is recessed.